You're listening to Bark and Wag's 15-Minute Vet Talk. Each week, your host, Polly Requa, interviews veterinarians and individuals in the pet industry from across the nation answering pet questions. Bark and Wag podcast is produced weekly for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at BarkandWag.com under the podcast tab. That's B-A-R-K-N-W-A-G.com. Please remember to subscribe to Bark and Wag 15-Minute Vet Talk. Welcome to Bark and Wag 15-Minute Vet Talk. I'm your host, Polly Requa. Today, we're talking to Dr. Millie Armstrong, owner of Petty Brook Veterinarian Clinic in Vermont. And today, we're going to talk about the negative effects when you put a dog flea collar on a cat. Welcome, Millie. Hi. Thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. I actually saw on the news that if you put a flea collar, a dog flea collar on a cat, it can cause the cat to have seizures and actually die. And so I never knew that. So I wanted to bring you on the podcast and uh, let our listeners know what actually happens. Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people aren't aware that a lot of the products in the flea products are toxic. And it depends on which species we're talking about. So obviously, they've got label instructions on them to try to prevent toxic events within the animals. So the ones that are the most toxic in cats tend to be a product called pyrethrin or permethrin, which is a product that originally comes from the chrysanthemum plant. So you would think that it would be an all-natural product, and it should be really safe, and it should work. But the problem is the chemical has an effect on the nerves, the nervous system. And it can be extreme, cats are extremely insensitive to it. And so if they come in contact with this pyrethrin or permethrin product or any of the other synthetic permethrins, anything that ends with an R-I-N in the name of the active ingredient is very likely to be a permethrin type product. And you want to avoid the use of that in cats because the cat's nervous system is very sensitive to this and will lead to anything from muscle tremors or muscle twitching to full-blown seizures or it could lead to death if it's not caught and treated pretty quickly. So we try to avoid the use of permethrins in cats either in flea collars or with the new topical spot-ons. And so you want to read the label very carefully, not just for the species that the product is labeled for use in or on, but also if there are any other side warnings on avoiding contact, because it's not just about putting the product on the cat. They can come in contact with it if you've used it on your dog and the dog and cat tend to snuggle up on the same dog bed or the couch, or if the cat grooms the dog, they can ingest the product this way or if you use anything for environmental treatment like sprays or out in the yard. A lot of the lawn treatment companies will sometimes use these products out in the yard. So you wanna make sure to avoid your pets having access to that until after the product is dried or the company tells you it's safe to have let the pets out there. So it's not just permethrins and pyrethrins, there are other products and in particular one called organophosphates which can also cause some pretty serious neurological changes and salivation and seizures and things. They are very toxic. So you really want to read the packaging closely. There are a lot of new products out there right now for treating fleas and dogs and cats. And most of the better products are using a combination of something to kill the adult flea, but also two of the other stages of the flea's life cycle. I think that's another place that people don't tend to think about is a flea life cycle. There are four stages. There's the adult, the eggs, the larvae, and then this other form called a pupa stage. And it's the pupa stage, it's like a cocoon, and it's impenetrable. The the medications don't penetrate that, and they can survive in the environment for up to six months or more. And so when that stage starts hatching, you start having more problems with fleas again, and people will say, oh, the flea products I'm using aren't working. It's not that they're not working, it's the flea has figured out how to work around the flea products and will survive and, and continue to hatch out down the road just when you think it's safe, like this time of year. In the wintertime, you feel like, oh, there aren't any fleas outside. Well, 
you're right, but they're in the house and they're hatching out inside. So you're, you see a lot <laughs> of people who are starting to have problems again and they feel like it's because their products aren't working or maybe they let up on their flea control and they haven't continued it every single month. So you want to keep going with your flea products, but definitely talk to a veterinarian about what is best to use because some do have other side effects that you want to watch very closely in terms of how old the animal should be, how much, how much the dog or cat weighs because there are weight restrictions on some of these products. There are some decent over-the-counter products, but I haven't been too happy with a lot of them because I really don't feel like they're working very well or they're just not designed to treat as many stages of the life cycle as we possibly can. And I think that's where, if you have any questions about what to use, you can definitely talk to your veterinarian. And does the same thing, is it true then if you put a, like vice versa, so if you put a cat flea collar on a dog, does the dog get sick or no? Depends on the product. Okay. But yes. You want okay. to definitely read the label. Okay. And then I've seen too, where people will feel like, well, they'll start playing with the dosage. They'll think, well, this is a small cat. Maybe if I put my small dog dose or my half of my small dog dose on my cat, that will be okay because it's not a whole dog dose. Oh no. But it doesn't work that way. It, it's there. It has to do with their sensitivities to the different chemicals and whether their liver and their body has the enzymes to process those chemicals because sometimes they build up in the bloodstream at such a level because the body can't clear them out. So you, you really want to be careful. You can't just cross the species like that or try to tweak the dose because it doesn't always work out quite that way. You know, it's really interesting because you wouldn't think about, I mean, I can see people doing that. Oh, I'm just going to yeah. buy yeah, a that cat. Happens. Yeah. And I know that they mean well, and, I, and I'm not saying that these are people who, who are, you know, not really thinking about these things, but the, but the problem is that unfortunately it just doesn't work out that way. It, it's not, it's not what you would think might be logical. It, it, it has more to do with what the cats and dogs are sensitive to and what they can are capable of tolerating. Sure. Well, thank you very much for these tips. I look forward to having you back on the podcast. Well, thank you, Polly. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Bark and Wag's 15-Minute Vet Talk. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, www.barkandwag.com, to your friends and other pet owners. Have a pressing question for a veterinarian? Ask your question at BarkandWag.com under the podcast tab. This has been a KFR production. Join us next time for another edition of Bark and Wag's 15-Minute Vet Talk.